So I'm glad to be here at John Jay for a number of reasons. Um, the first one is that uh, Just Leadership USA, the organization I run, actually houses our leadership trainings here going forward. Thank you to um, President Carol Mason. Thank you, Carol. Um, and thank you to the Center for American Progress and Draper Richards Kaplan and other organizations who were involved in the planning of this event, including Just Leadership USA. So the name of this panel is Voices of the Impacted Community. And uh, the folks who helped to organize the event gave me some very specific directions on how to engage this panel. And we had a planning call last week that was supposed to last for about 30 minutes, but it lasted for about seven minutes. And I said to folks, we're gonna just break the rules and we're gonna make it up as we go along. And if you don't know me, I'm like into breaking the rules. So if this doesn't sound like any of the other panels, it's very deliberate. And I almost have no clue what any of these folks are gonna say in response to my questions. So when I hear voices of, impact, of the impacted community, for me, you know, it, it's actually always been a, a bit confusing because I'm, I'm always trying to figure out sort of where do I fit into this uh, discussion about criminal justice reform. And I remember sitting here in this institution on the ninth floor actually, and um, I was on a panel like this and I was next to the Manhattan DA, uh, Cy Vance. And uh, at some point in the middle of a conversation about reentry, about 20 minutes in, um, DA Vance said, you know, Glenn, we've talked about uh, reentry of offenders for 20 minutes. We should switch and, and talk about um, victims of crime. And I think it was the first time since leaving prison 12 years earlier that I responded the way I did, and I'm not sure where it came from, but I said to him, you know, DA Vance, with, with all due respect, um, I didn't learn how to pull out a gun on someone until someone pulled out a gun on me. And when I was the survivor of a crime, your office didn't seem as interested in me as a survivor of a crime. And yet when I became the alleged perpetrator of a crime, your office was hugely interested. Um, it was a moment for me to define myself as a survivor in a way that I had never done for my entire life. Although I remember so many moments of people pulling out guns and pointing it at me and, and stealing things and taking jewelry and, and many of the other things that I faced growing up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, Brooklyn as a young person. And so I actually deliberately didn't spend a ton of time reading all of the bios of the folks here on this stage because I wanted them to even surprise me in terms of the perspective they come from uh, and the way they define themselves as a voice of the impacted community. So I'm gonna read really short bios, just one or two lines, and then I'm just gonna open it up to Q&A and then 20 minutes before we're done, and it's gonna look magical, but there's a clock here uh, that's giving me a tremendous amount of anxiety that's gonna tell me when there's 20 minutes left. And I promise to open it up to the audience for questions, only questions. Um, so Akila, uh, to my right, Sherils, I got it right? Yes, sir. Cool, just learned it behind stage, uh, is from the Alliance for Safety and Justice. Um, in his bio, it says survivor and national training director for the Alliance for Safety and Justice. And the Alliance brings healing and recovery services to communities least helped and most harmed. Um, Carlos De Leon, to his right, is from the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, and he is with the coalition, and his focus is on juvenile justice reform. And Dion Wilson, to his right, also from the Alliance, how do you guys pull this off? You're both from the Alliance for Safety and Justice. Um, can I get somebody from Just Leadership on the stage, just to <laughs> balance this shit out? Um, so Dion Wilson, from the Alliance, oh, got it, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, Dion Wilson, Alliance for Safety and Justice, is a national survivor advocate for the uh, Alliance, advocating for victim services and policies that focus on the true drivers of crime and that increase public safety. Welcome. Um, Ilam Askia, I killed it, right? Um, from Gideon's Promise. Uh, Ilham, Ilham, Ilham is the executive director and co-founder of Gideon's Promise, a national nonprofit organization focused on building a movement of public defenders to transform the criminal justice system by providing advocacy for the poor. As a child of a formerly incarcerated person, um, Ms. Askia uh, believes that all people should be treated with dignity in the courts. And Vivian Nixon, whose name there's no way I can butcher because she's my board chair and she's my boss and she intimidates the hell out of me. 
Um, she's, the exec she's also the executive director of the College and Community Fellowship, a nonprofit that helps formerly incarcerated women earn their college degrees. Uh, an alumna of CCF's program herself, uh, Vivian advocates nationally for the return of education to our nation's prisons, along with her work in the uh, criminal justice reform space. She's also a Columbia University community scholar amongst her many other achievements. So uh, quick welcome to the panelists, please. So Dion, you and I had a quick exchange during lunch and I am eager for you to say the same thing you said to me during lunch here on this stage, but I'm not gonna start there. Um, I'm actually gonna start right here to my right with Akila. And you know, you often talk about um, uh, the people who experience the most harm in society and yet receive the least amount of help. Can you sort of build that out a bit for the audience so people understand where you're coming from when you say that? Sure. Um, again, Akila Shirelles, uh, the Alliance for Safety and Justice. Um, I am a survivor, both a, cyber, a survivor of a CSA, of childhood sexual abuse, and uh, I'm a part of that, that coveted club that nobody wants to be a member of. Um, uh, my oldest son, Terrell, was murdered 12 years ago. This case is still a cold case. And um, far too many, you know, uh, uh, black American, brown American folks are losing their children's lives um, with very little um, recourse from the system. Um, if you don't hold the, uh, the, the system's perspective on justice, um, then there's a real possibility that your case, if you lose a child, your, your child's case will be a cold case, right? So, so the, the, the question is the least help, the most harm. So I, I started with an organization, California's for Safety and Justice, and co-founded um, the largest um, survivors Network in the state of California, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice. We're over 5,000 members across the state. And, you know, um, one, of, one of the ways, um, and, and I come from this out of the whole gang prevention and intervention movement. Me and my brother and them organized a peace treaty between the Crips and Bloods in 1992 that changed the quality of life in our community. And, and this, to me, was real uh, kind of like public safety, providing services to those who are least helped and most harmed. Um, so as I began to organize um, the, the crime survivors of safety and justice movement in the state, we um, first identified all of those folks who were a part of the whole gang prevention and intervention movement. Because although many of those individuals are formerly incarcerated, many of them are also survivors as well. Um, and, and you know, it's this old strange thing in society. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, statistically, you know, in our neighborhood, I would say that the number one preemptive cause for murder in our community is self-defense. And a lot of times, as, as Glenn was saying, you go to the police department as a victim, as a survivor, to, to, to try to get services and help, and you're kind of like, you know, shown the door in a, in a, in a sense, right? So um, as we begin to have conversations with folks in the community, you know, black and brown folks don't traditionally identify as, as victims. It has a negative connotation in the neighborhood. So we change the narrative, we change the language, um, and we call ourselves survivors because it speaks to that one has had an experience and conceivably don't want it to happen to anyone else, and that you're engaged in your respective healing journey. So um, a part of that, you know, there's always been a real strong victims' rights movement in the state and across the country. Um, and, and unfortunately, this victims' rights movement has been responsible for a lot of the draconian laws that were passed in the state of California, like three strikes, like Prop 21 that charges our, our, our children with, um, you know, giving our kids life without the possibility of parole and those different types of things. And, and, and I like to say that we like to, I like to, you know, I empathize with those, uh, those victims, you know, because they lost their children and loved ones and family members to heinous crimes. But many of the laws that they pushed over the years um, has impacted, you know, communities of color negatively, right? Um, in our neighborhood, someone is harmed. We deploy law enforcement and force to apprehend the perpetrator, but we don't deploy therapists and healers and, you know, uh, counselors to help people deal with the after effect of violence. Right? So one of the things that we had to ask is what victims want. And what we discovered that in the state of California, nobody had polled anybody in the state and asked them anything. It was just an assumption. And then we found out that even nationally, no one had polled victims nationally and even asked them what they wanted. Um, and so we did that. And what we discovered is that the least help and most harm, and this is both in the state of California and also nationally, are actually um, African American and Latino young men. Um, those who are um, a part of the LGBT community and those who are um, uh, um, 
uh, physically handicapped in many cases. Um, but yet, we don't get the, the, the services that we need to support us in our respective healing journeys. So another brief question uh, requiring a brief response, which is what, what do survivors want? Survivors want um, healing and recovery services over incarceration. They want education 15 to 1 um, over incarceration. They want um, like community supervision 2 to 1 over incarceration. You know, they want, uh, you know, man, they want to have access to healing services. You know, of course they want the perpetrator to be held accountable as well. Um, however, that's, that's one thing. So, so thank you for sharing your personal story. I think whenever you share uh, personal stories like this with an audience, it takes a tremendous amount of courage. So thank you for doing that. Um, can you give me one word description of a criminal justice system that you'd like to see emerge from all this advocacy that's happening? Give me one adjective to describe that system that would work for you as a survivor. Uh, transformative. I'm gonna, thank you. I'm gonna move over to Ilham. Um, I thought we were going in order, Glenn. Yeah, you know what? And then I'll get accused of just men talking to men. So <laughs> I'm way ahead of this. And I would probably um, be the first person to say that too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yes, I learned your personality in two seconds behind stage. Like, so um, well, you did set the panel up like a, a um, orthodox B. temple: <laughs> women on one side, men on the other. See, it's like the Dayton game. Give, give Vivian a softball; she'll knock it out the park. Thank you. All right. So here's my question to you: There's this national discussion happening about criminal justice reform, and it's focusing heavily on over policing focusing heavy, heavily on prosecutorial discretion. We heard a lot of uh, that today in the short time that we've been here. Talk to me about stakeholders who don't seem to be involved in this discussion and why is it important for them to be involved? You know, it's so, I'm so excited to be here. I got on this 6 a.m. flight. Didn't want, I, I'm not a morning person, but I'm glad I did because I got to hear the earlier panel, panelists. And um, public defenders, um, the work that I do, I run an organization that works to train, mentor, and support public defenders to change the culture of the criminal justice system by really ingraining um, confidence, power in the public defenders who want to do great work. They want to help people. They want to tell the stories of the accused. And what I find going across the country is in this national discussion, I, I'm not a lawyer. I play one on TV, I play one on a panel sometimes, but I'm not a lawyer. And what I find is that public defenders are often absent in the national conversation. I hear some grassroots organization talking about policy reform and all these things legislators should do, but they never have the people who are impacted by these policies sitting at the table. And if they are at the table, they're often voiceless they're, they're, or they're ignored. And even with this conference, and I'm glad that we had a great committee of leaders who were really thoughtful about figure, talking about smart on crime, but in the beginning, I think there, the public defenders were absent. And this criminal justice system, transformative is the word we use at Gideon's Promise all the time to change it. It needs to be dismantled. It wasn't built properly. It's not functioning properly. And the only people in that long conveyor belt line that actually advocate for the accused are public defenders, but they're often ignored. They're under-resourced, they're not paid, a lot of times they're not trained, and the, the system of the culture beats the passion out of them that they don't stay. And so at Gideon's Promise, we work to ingrain that passion, tell them it's important that the person next to you is a live human being. And people talk about the humanity and the humanity. And there was a gentleman who, who uh, one of the co-founders of the catering company, I'm going to steal his line, I don't know if he's here, I'm going to steal it next time I speak, about it's not about the person who was accused feeling humane. They felt human when they got arrested. They didn't want, they felt terrible. It's making everyone else see the humanity in that person, and that's what public defenders do. And I, and, and I, I get so bothered by the fact that we are often absent. And if we are standing on stage, we are often ignored. We have been talking about all of these reform efforts for decades. Don Diener, the public defender in Nashville, Tennessee, they had a panel just before here, and she was talking about it. Until once prosecutors or police officers or anyone on the front end of the justice system says, 
oh, we have an idea. People are listening because they are perceived as the people with the most power. But public defenders have been talking about this since 1963 when the, the uh, US uh, Supreme Court decided Gideon. And so we have to have more convenings like this that have really thought my, mindful people say, who is missing on that stage? So why and do you that's think why Gideon's promise exists, so I can be the loud mouth to say that they are missing. We wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> um, so why do you think public defenders really quickly have been invisibilized in this conversation? I don't think they see them as a powerful tool for advocacy. I think there's a narrative that people who represent what is considered the worst of the worst are just as bad as they are. And I think it has just been an oversight. I, I don't know. I, I, I really cannot understand why um, they are ignored, but I think there is a narrative that is drawn up in this country about poor people and people of color. And if you are the person that's charged with representing them, you are also absent because we have been absent in terms of reform for, for far too long. It's always been that way. Thank you. So I'm going to turn to Carlos. Um, you know, Carlos, you're going to talk about the juvenile justice population, the juvenile justice system. Um, if there's anywhere, you know, I run an organization that has a goal of half by 2030, cutting the number of people under correctional supervision in half by 2030. And when I think about the success that's happened in the juvenile justice space, it gives me hope, and I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but I'd love for you to weave some of that into your talk. Um, but why, why is it vital for us to continue to work to fix our juvenile justice system in the United States? Um, well, for me, the reason I do this work is because I was affected by the juvenile justice system. I went in when I was 16 years old. I was facing seven life sentences and more years than I could possibly do in this lifetime. And um, when, I, when I went in, I had gone in before. I had gone in when I was 11, 12, 13, and there wasn't like, there wasn't, there wasn't nothing in place for me to work on me. I wasn't able to deal with my addiction. I wasn't able to deal with the trauma that I suffered as a child. And so these things festered and they grew and I became a worse individual and I became a gang member. And my anger was um, used in very negative ways, which led me to face all the time that I did. And when I went to prison, when I first went to juvenile hall, there was still nothing there for us. There wasn't these great programs that Scott ran into when um, he started working with us in uh, the in Silmar. Um, so I mean, pretty much what they would do for us is we'd watch TV, we'd watch movies, and we'd go to our cells, and we'd go to court, and we'd face our time, and we eventually all went to prison. And in prison, not dealing with the issues that were that would led you there. I mean, how can you how can you reform yourself? And it took many years for me to really see the light and see what I needed to do and prepare myself for reentry. And once I did, I mean, it was amazing. Once I left behind the gangs and I started working on me and dealing with the issues that I had as a child and dealing with uh, my addiction, then I was able to help my other pop the other people in the population. And I ran chairs for NA, CGA, Criminals Gangs Anonymous. And when I got out, Scott gave me the opportunity to go back to Sacramento and make new policies, make, help pass these legislative bills that are gonna help people like me who go to prison as a child and change their lives and really put that effort to be able to get out early. Because if it weren't for the SB 260 that let me get out, I'd still be in prison. If it weren't for AB 1308, which we just passed, there's uh, 3,000 more inmates that are still just gonna be in prison serving these long sentences when in fact they've They've done things that, that make them worthy to come home. They've worked on themselves. They're able to um, become a positive influence in their communities. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to me to see that. I... You know, when, when I was here in New York, um, we charged 16-year-olds as adults. And when I got locked up at 16, I ended up at Rikers Island with many other children, 16 to 17 uh, years old. And I quickly realized that if prison is where we send bad people who do bad things, then where do we send good people who do bad things? Um, because I met some really good people. And in prison, you don't talk about the type of conviction that got you there. It's just part of the culture, right? Like, that's just not what you lead with. It's not what you talk about. But there's been a lot of discussion here today about who deserves opportunity and who doesn't. And how does that land for you? Um, you were here earlier. You heard some of the discussion. What does that mean for you as someone who has served time in the juvenile justice system? Um, 
You know, when we, do, uh, when we do this legislative work and we're asking for senators and assembly members to pass our bills and, you know, they're, we're representing violent criminals, essentially. Um, these people are murderers, as Scott said, attempt to murder, assault with deadly weapons. What we tell them is that these bills are put in place not to uh, get anybody a free pass, because by all means, which if you committed the crime and you don't want to work on yourself, then you deserve to be in prison. But if you're gonna work on yourself, if you're gonna think of, oh, in California, we have a board, BPH. So when you go to BPH, you pretty much analyze your whole life, from childhood all the way to the commitment of the crime. You talk about causative factors, motivational factors. You, you have to really tinker at everything in your life and you have to explain it to them. And if they feel that, they don't, that you don't understand why you committed the crime or why you um, led down the road of destruction, they're not gonna give you an early release date. So if you're able to do that, if you're able to educate yourself and you know uh, take advantage of the opportunities that you have inside, such as vocational, job training, and then you go to board and then they see you fit, then the likelihood of you coming back, if you guys were here earlier, you hear is it's the people who, who come out on our bills, they don't, they don't go back to prison. Our, our percentage rated for the juveniles is 1.5, 1.5, and that 1.5 was a violation. It wasn't a new charge. It wasn't somebody who committed a new offense. He just violated parole. Hey, Glenn, can I say something? To, to yeah, add sure, to jump because in. I think what Carlos is talking about is so important because we're talking about a lot of the post-conviction stuff. And we're when you ask me a question about public defenders, their role is to tell that story before they're incarcerated. And so if you tell the story of impact, having family members present, having that this person may have had a drug problem, or they have PTSD. I mean, there are studies out about children that grow up in the communities where I grew up, having these post-traumatic stress disorders from the violence, from the poverty. I remember having to look over my shoulder walking to the school bus stop because my mom taught me, make sure your sister's okay because you never know. That's trauma. I think if you tell that story, those public defenders tell that story of the people who are accused. So I just wanted to say something to add to that because I'm a, a child of a formerly incarcerated person, and the one story I never hear in the courts, unless it's a good public defender telling about impact, is how it would affect us. When my father was locked up, he was arrested. He was charged with crimes that he had committed eight years prior to his arrest. He had changed his life. He owned a small uh, fish market, and he got arrested because he was walking while black. They ran his record, he had changed his name, they found out Donald Brown is now Shakar Askia. I'm sorry, Shakar Askia was Donald Brown, and they arrested him, and they never told how it would rip our family apart. And my father went to Attica Correctional Facility, which I believe Rikers and Attica were like neck and neck in terms of the worst state prisons here in New York, and when he got out, he was, he was 6'4", 200, 221 he went in. He was like 160 pounds, he was thin, and he chose to live in the cinder block basement of my grandmother's house and schedule visits for his kids to see him because he became so institutionalized. And no one told the story of impact so he wouldn't get incarcerated. His public defender who he was assigned did not give this man value in the courts. And it wasn't the PD's fault. I think he was growing up professionally in a society where to process people was the name of the game. And so before we get to have, so we don't have stories like Carlos, but I think also is very brave to tell his story. We need to have public defenders tell the story of the people who are being accused. So we don't have to have conferences like this to talk about reentry and finding jobs. Cool, thank you. Um, so thank you to both of you for sharing very personal stories also. So Dion, I want to turn to you. Um, we were at lunch and I said to you, are you comfortable uh, with the question I'm going to ask you? And you said, ah, that's not really what I want to talk about, but I don't think I should talk about what I want to talk about today. And I won't steal your thunder. I'm going to give you a chance to talk about it. But if I asked you, what is a, similarly, what is a, who is a, a stakeholder population that is either not at the table or you think uh, is not getting the sort of bandwidth that other stakeholders are getting on this issue and why does that concern you? And we're gonna turn it up a notch now. It's on you, Dion. No pressure there, <laughs> thanks. Just make sure you Appreciate it. <laughs> um, wow. You may not. We all do. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay, so my, uh, oh, this is 
become such a hard space for me to exist in. So I'm, as what um, anecdotally is uh, referred to as the perfect crime victim. No criminal history, white woman, police officer husband was murdered in the line of duty. So I'm not sure there is a better combination of characteristics to garner more sympathy from the public than my story. Um, I'm also currently married to a deputy sheriff. This happened in 2005, and uh, my decision to marry into law enforcement, again, wasn't purposeful. He was my high school sweetheart, and we reconnected in 2012, and I said, so what do you do for a living? And he went, uh, it, it was a little awkward, but, you know, um, so I had a really interesting journey through being the widow of a fallen police officer and having the mindset that I did um, before he was killed. I, I was a typical um, cop wife, typical conservative um, And then, so as we went through the prosecution of the case and spent, um, you know, um, not very much time going through the um, court proceeding because it was pretty open and shut. There's really no question that he did it and he never denied that he did it. Um, and then, when he was convicted and got the death penalty and was sent to San Quentin to sit on death row for God knows how long, probably ever, I, I you know, that was my justice. I, it was, that's what I wanted. And for the four years after that, I wondered why I didn't feel better. I wanted to feel better. I was told that I would feel better and it didn't work for me. It works for some people, it just didn't work for me. And I thought, well, okay, there has to be something more. And I got connected with um, Robert Rooks, who was the organizing director of Californians for Safety and Justice, and he um, set me on a path that would literally change the course of my life. I ended up um, campaigning for um, criminal justice reform in California that was very successful. And um, I ended up going into San Quentin and sitting with a group of prisoners for two years and learning about why. I, I had to know why. Why do people do these things? Because I, I just had no I had no concept of it before. I didn't grow up in a poor community of color that was impacted by violence. I didn't know what that meant. Never even heard those words before. And when I sat with those men for two years, almost every week, I learned a lot. And it opened my eyes. And I became a very passionate advocate for, um, for society to start facing what the true drivers of crime really are. And I wanted to get on the side of preventing, preventing those instances and not just punishing on the back end, but what can we do to stop it on the front end? And over the years, that I've been involved with this and learning all that I've learned, now I am seeing a division grow between law enforcement and the communities that they serve. And it's, 
heartbreaking. I thought for a while it was going to get better, and it's not. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. I see the community I love and understand and resonate with being pushed harder and harder, further and further away. And I see the communities that are impacted who I now have come to love and not fully resonate with. I can't possibly, I can't understand it. I didn't grow up that way. It is, I can't possibly get it. But I see the sides pushing each other farther and farther away. And I don't know what the answer to that is, but I love what was said on the last panel that I think that public safety is really what we all want. And I think we're biting at each other over our differences and ignoring our common goals. And I'm, I, I think I'm skirting your question. <laughs> I'm really no. sorry. This is that, very hard for me. No, I appreciate you sharing that. That is exactly what we talked about upstairs, and except you sort of led with the piece about the division between law enforcement and communities and how much concern you had for that alienating of law enforcement from the discussion. And so I wanted to have that said out loud in this space, particularly because I think the audience uh, may have a very specific reaction to that. Um, so if we could... Hold on to that for a second. Thank you for sharing your story, please. So I heard your story a few years ago, and thank you for sharing it again. Um, I want to turn to Vivian. I actually want to turn my seat just a little bit, because I feel sort of rude not looking at you folks in the face as you share these stories. Um, so Vivian, Orange is the New Black, own, the OWN Network. There's all this stuff in popular culture now about criminal justice, about people coming out of prison, about mass incarceration, 13th, and it seems to have uh, generated a narrative in this country that's starting to push back a bit on the one that we've held on to for the last uh, four and a half decades, but which direction is it pushing it? Uh, is, do you think that there's posit enough positivity coming out of this sort of popular culture, ownership of this issue, um, or do you think that it's actually hurting uh, the, the movement, if you will, and, um, and just sort of expound on that a bit. Um, well, for me, context is everything. So whether it's uh, a narrative driven by popular media uh, or a narrative driven by sound bites of a political campaign, um, we have to look at it all in context. So Orange is the New Black, popular television show may have raised awareness concerning um, women in prison, which um, for years and years doing this work, the, the pronouns she or her or hers were never used in discussions about criminal justice. It was always, you know, him, his, it was always the male, the male pronoun used, and women were being incarcerated at larger and larger numbers, which um, actually exceeded the rate at which men were being incarcerated. Um, thankfully, some people paid attention to that and did some research to prove that, that women were the fastest growing population going to prison. So that exposure of the issue um, was a positive ramification of Orange is the New Black. I think that the longer these things go on and become kind of a loop on a channel and a, a, an activity to binge, binge watch, the less um, grave the situation seems to the public. It normalizes this. Like, oh, no, you know, these people seem relatively functional and happy living inside this prison, right? Um, so. It's all about context. When, when, when I look at you know, documentaries like uh, 13th, The Return, these are tools to educate the public of, about the foundations of the criminal justice system and about the realities of people being released from the system. I don't have a problem with that, but I do have a problem with any um, media 
or culture of information, um, that's what media is, it, it's what informs the public, um, that, that generates a single narrative. Because there is no single narrative for people who are impacted by this criminal justice system. There are many narratives, many circumstances, uh, and many solutions, many roads out of this uh, for individuals. The context in which this happens for individuals matters even more. That it does not matter what we say or do in this room or what ideas we come up with to reform on the front end, the back end, or the middle end, if we can acknowledge the environment in which we are doing this work. We have to acknowledge that we are doing this work, like Rashad is doing his work, Brittany is doing her work, trying to stand up for poor communities of color uh, against state violence in a context where the FBI is now saying that black identity extremism is terroristic activity. Can we not like recognize the world we're living in? Like my standing up for black women in prison could be identified by the state as a terrorist activity because it could be claimed to be black identity um, uh, extremism. So we can't separate the narrow view we have of criminal justice reform from the larger political context in which reform is happening, where it's okay to march down a street with torches to protest at night, but it's not okay to be extremely black. So thank you for that, Vivian. I'm gonna, so we have enough time here for another series of questions if each person takes two or three minutes to respond, because I wanna give the audience a chance to get in here, particularly because I see some John Jay student, students in the audience also. Um, so Akila, so you have a certain legitimacy in this space that I think is hugely valuable to the discussion, uh, rarely brought to the table, only more recently, if you will, um, and yet at the same time, you're one survivor out of many. And if you are having a discussion with another survivor of crime who is thirsty for uh, retribution and punishment as a way to make them feel whole again, how do you respond to that? How do you respond? Have you come across other survivors who say, oh, you got to be kidding me. That sounds soft on crime. How do you respond? Give the audience the narrative. Oh, all the students are leaving. I was serious. <laughs> I was going to give you guys a chance to ask a question. Um, <laughs> How do you respond to someone who has a very antithetical thought about where we should be heading with our criminal justice system, who also is a survivor of crime? Um, absolutely. Um, again, you know, there, there are survivors, you know, domestic violence, sexual assault, uh, you know, childhood sexual abuse, state violence survivors, street, uh, you know, survivors. I think that, um, um, you know, the place kind of like where I enter the conversation is I, I tell my own story. Because I think that when you expose the, the vulnerabilities and the deep secrets about your own experience, you give others permission to do the same. And, um, and, and so I, I talk about my experience as a survivor, um, you know, the uh, navigating the criminal justice system and, and, you know, and the, you know, what was the response. And, um, and, and, and honestly, you know, one of the things that I share with them is that, you know, we, we might have different kind of political or philosophical views but I think that the common denominator that all survivors um, will agree upon is that we all want to heal from the trauma that we've experienced as a result of, um, of the harm. But you, you just talked about navigating the criminal justice system. For people who get incarcerated for committing crimes, there's an assumption that survivors of crime are the ones that are treated best. Um, I sat with a prosecutor uh, last week in my office um, from the Brooklyn DA's office who said she often gets calls from survivors of crime to say, you haven't helped me one bit. Mm -hmm. Can you help the audience understand that, particularly folks who are not sort of in this work day to day, why you're uh, suggesting, why you're even referring to your engagement with the criminal justice system as navigating the system? Yeah, because, uh, you know, because of racism and implicit bias, a black person comes into the, the police department after being victimized, and they're asking you, what did you do, right? Um, because we know that racism and implicit bias is real in the culture. 
And uh, so Have you had this experience? Absolutely. Can you tell a story instead of speaking as if you're referring to someone else? Can you say I tell a story? I walked into a precinct. I walked into a prosecutor's office, and here's what happened. Uh, bigger than that, my son was murdered. Okay, I'm a celebrated activist in the city of Los Angeles, so I know the sheriff, I know the mayor, I know all of these folks. So I get an opportunity to go on America's Most Wanted, and I plead for this young man to turn himself in because. As again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well respected in the hood as well. And we know what the conditioned response is in, in the neighborhood. You know, you take one of mine's because folks love and respect me, the conditioned response is that we're going to take two of yours. So I had to literally go and stop the homies from enacting street justice, right? And so then as I went and, and told the, uh, the reporter, and then here's the, the detective who's working on my case is standing right next to the reporter as I'm, you know, pleading for this young man to turn himself in. Um, afterwards, the detective said, it sounds like you have compassion for this murderer. This guy killed your son. And he's all passionate about it. And I said, uh, I said, I do have compassion for this person. And I said, um, because I said, I know far too many young people who are broken and wounded and fractured in their own lives. And they make terrible decisions out of these places of fear. And I said, I don't condone what he did, you know, but to ask the question why, you know, um, a kid like would be disconnected and would take another human life, being's life, is not condoning what he did. You know, I'm like, I want to understand so that we can prevent, right, this from happening again. And uh, and the response was, I mean, he just stared at me because I didn't believe in his kind of justice, right? And as a result, even though we gave him, because you know the streets is relentless. A week later, his homies called us and gave the name, address, and telephone number of this kid. You know, I stopped my homies from, and my family members from harming them. I gave the police a name, address, telephone number. I gave them two witnesses of young folks who said that they would come forward and testify. And my son's case has been a cold case for 12 years. They never followed up. They never called me. Nothing. Now, what did I do? What did I do to deserve that type of disrespect? And I feel like I'm pretty sophisticated. I know how to navigate the system. I understand criminal justice. I understand, you know, laws. Um, but yet, um, my son's case is a cold case. Akila, thank you for responding to the question. Thank you, more importantly, for being so compassionate. Um, I think what you just said out loud is something we don't often hear from human beings generally, much less someone who lost a child. Um, Carlos, I want to turn to you. If you can sort of go back in time and you're standing in front of that judge, right, that judge that doesn't have an appetite for risk, that judge that's looking down onto a child and maybe thinking about uh, if I give this, this person liberty, what's it going to mean for me if this person reoffends? The, the judge that would still probably answer that question the same way today, what would you say to that judge? Um, uh, my judge's name was Dale Fisher out of CCB. You know her name. <laughs> I'd say, um, excuse me, Ms. Fisher, um, I understand that I was 16 years old and my crimes are um, very serious. They are violent crimes. I let her know that even though at the time, at 16, I didn't know what empathy was, and it took me to about 24 to really understand that. Um, I said that there's still hope for me. I'd say that inside is still a kid who was harmed, who was uh, witnessed violence, and eventually became accustomed to violence, and then lived out his life in violent ways that there's still hope and there's still somebody inside who can become a better individual, who could better himself, who could educate himself, and then change other people's lives so that they don't go down the same path that I did. So let me push you, let me push you a bit. So who in the criminal justice system doesn't deserve that sort of opportunity? Honestly, I mean, I believe everybody deserves that opportunity. There, there, there isn't anybody in the criminal justice system that I feel that can't change. Um, I wouldn't go to Sacramento and try to help push bills to get people to board to be able to prove that change to their commissioners, to these deputy commissioners, if I didn't feel that way. I've been around LWAPs. I've been around Lives Without the Possibilities. That's LWAP, 25 to life, 15 to life, every, every, every sentence possible, from level four is all the way down to level two. And in everybody that I've been around, I see a different side of that person that most people don't get to see. When I sit in a group and I run a NA group or a criminal and gangs anonymous group and we're talking about family and we're talking about childhood and, and, and the similarities that we have with each other, 
there's there's violence there. There's things that they grew up with that they didn't know how to deal with, and they acted out. And unfortunately, people got hurt. And although it's not it's it's not to say that they can that what they did isn't is isn't wrong, and it's very wrong what they did. I understand that. But still, there's still hope for everybody. No matter what you've done in life, there's always that chance to change. Thank you, Dion. Um, I think I told you at lunchtime that my older brother uh, grew up to be first a correction officer for 10 years and now a U.S. Marshal. Um, Thanksgiving is complicated at my place, um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and as a black man in America, I literally have a difficult time having discussions with my own brother about his job and how he thinks about his job. and and the narrative that he uses to, to uh, be able to do his job. I mean, my brother is a good person. Uh, he he uh, articulates that he's not abusive. And at the same time, he narrows, he sort of rounds that out with, you know, I didn't bring these people here, right? Like, I just have a job to do, and as long as I'm not causing harm, uh, then I'm not playing a role in upholding the system. Not, no systemic analysis. Uh, whatsoever. And so when I heard you at lunch say, I feel as though law enforcement is being alienated from the conversation, I had like black man in America visceral reaction to that. Um, and I felt as though there was a privilege for a, a white woman, uh, even a white woman who's been the survivor of crime, who is so close to law enforcement, um, to be able to say that. And I would bet there are at least one or two people in the audience who might have had a similar reaction to that, given where we are in this country. Um, and, the, and the sort of peeling back of the onion with respect to law enforcement engagement of people of color. How do you respond to that? How do you, how do you recognize the flip side of the coin that you um, put on the table? And how would you articulate to someone like me the importance of balancing uh, keeping law enforcement tethered to the conversation with the reality of being a black man in America and the interactions that I have with law enforcement? I'd give you an easy follow-up question. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the softball. That was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> wow. Oh, um, gosh, there was so much said here today that, that I, I that I want to respond to. It's it's hard to channel it. Um, and I think we, you know, we in these spaces we talk a lot about incarcerated people and and what they have had to deal with growing up and and I I went into San Quentin and I, I witnessed that um, and I I understand intellectually I don't understand experientially I never could but intellectually I get it now um, and I and I think where some of the division lies is when we tell these stories like the public defender told Irving's story in the courtroom, um, and, and she, did it, she did it very well, and at the same time, she kind of screwed him over with it because she tried too hard to humanize somebody that um, who who had no remorse in that moment. He had he he was sitting there joking with her, smirking, writing her little notes. She was hanging on his arm. It was disgusting. And so in that moment. That wasn't the right time. I, and I don't know when that right time is. I'm not saying I have the answer. I'm just saying that there needs to be some skill there to honor the experience. I had just lost my husband, my six-year-old daughter. All I could picture was her hugging her father's coffin and putting a flower on it. That's what was going through my mind. And when I heard 
that public defender trying to humanize this person that just destroyed my life? Mm, mm -mm. Um, it didn't go over well. And it didn't go over well with the jury because they came back with that guilty verdict in record time. And so when I had some separation from my devastation, from my grief, I look back on those moments and I look back on what Irving went through in his life, being um, taken out of his country of El Salvador during a very brutal civil war as a small child by his mother trying to save his life. I get that. I, can, I, I get that now. I didn't get it then. I didn't care. And I think that I think that sometimes in these spaces, we talk a lot about the impact of what, of what you grew up going through and how you, you, know, you know the trauma in, in these neighborhoods. Um, but there also has to be this realization that there's a very large group of people that we're talking to who don't know, who don't get it, they just see the devastated victim, and they say, well, what about the victim? What about your victim? What about Irving's victim? And being from a, coming from a law enforcement family and still being a part of one, I, um, I call out police brutality. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I want it to stop more than anything. And one of the biggest reasons is because not only it, it's just wrong, nobody should be victimized by people who are charged with keeping our communities safe, but it, it damages the good work and the legacy of my husband who was murdered, who wasn't that cop. His community loved him. And, and so... Um, pointing out these things is very hard because, believe me, I get it. I get it from both sides. Law enforcement thinks I'm too soft, and my people that I work with in this space go, "You don't get it. You don't. You're you, you're just siding with law enforcement." The pendulum is swinging too far. We have to bring it back a little. There are people in jail and in prison who are still stuck in, stuck in their cycle of violence. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, at my husband, where my husband works, a prisoner was walking down the stairs. Nothing was happening. It's all on video. The deputy looked up at him, acknowledging he's walking down, coming down for pill call, and out of nowhere, he flies down the stairs and punches that deputy in his face so hard that he fractured his orbital socket and beat him. There was no provocation. There was nothing. It just came out of nowhere. And, and that is not being acknowledged, that there are people who are still dealing with that. My husband still has to deal with that. Staff assaults are increasing, and no one's talking about it. So, Deanna, I'm going to stop you there because I know it elicited a response in you. I'm going to ask you to also hold on to this just to be disciplined here. And uh, it also elicited a response in you. And if it was a strong enough response, you can feel free to say, you know, to, to respond to that, but I did have a very specific question for you. I just wanted to say that I'm not saying that everyone who was arrested and commits a crime are all, some people, some people are, do bad things. Some people have done bad things. 
I think what Vivian, I want to take what Vivian said about looking at it at its whole context. And in terms of the public defender, I wasn't there for the trial. I'm not, I haven't been in a lot of trials. Like I said, I'm not a lawyer. I just know I have had my dad and my brother incarcerated, but we've also had my uncle shoot um, my uncle shoot my aunt and murder her. So I've been on both sides. But I think when you look at it in context, with the person who is being accused, we all said it on this panel. We've already gone in with the assumption of guilt just from the charge. And at times, the only person in that courtroom, when the media is attacking, when the judge is attacking, when the prosecutor, when the victim's families are attacking, the only person in that courtroom to give some value to the person who's accused is their attorney. And more often, with 80% of people going through the system, qualifying for a public defender, it's a public defender. I think that, but we have to look at it as context, just as people need, defenders need to be sensitive to what's going on around them, I think everyone needs to be sensitive. I think we are working in silos. I agree with you with that. But if you don't have someone there to represent the person who's considered the worst of the worst, then this whole criminal justice system is for naught. That's why I think it needs to be dismantled. I appreciate that. So Ilan, before I switch over to, to Vivian, I actually did have a specific question for you, and I'm gonna ask you, but I'm gonna ask you to respond relatively quickly, given the time. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna cut you off. Um, <laughs> you so, and I are gonna be friends for a long time. <laughs> um, I had a public defender who walked me through a grand jury proceeding as if I paid him $100,000, um, only to emerge with no true bill from that proceeding. I had a public defender who asked me to plea out the first time I appeared in front of a judge to five years probation, which arguably was the opening door into the rest of my life in the criminal justice system. Um, I think it's important that we acknowledge uh, that not all pub uh, public defenders are built the same. I agree. So what is That's your- That's why I exist. Right, so what- To <laughs> fix that problem. Um, what would, you know, actually, and also, just briefly, I mean, our campaign here in New York to close Rikers, for instance, it took just as long to convince public defenders that we can do something different as it did many other stakeholders. Like, they had sort of learned how to operate within the madness that is our criminal justice system. So what is your critique of the very folks that you have spent a lot of time on this stage uh, supporting? So I'll say this, which I didn't start off saying, is I didn't like public defenders. I'm one of those folks who, on, on, on the victim side, it was, you know, this is what happened. I was one of those people who watched people that I love being processed through the system and thought public defenders were the problem. I was an educator first, and I wanted to stop the school to prison pipeline. Then I realized if they didn't have a teacher like me, those kids that grew up in the neighborhoods where I taught, where I came from, they would get a public defender assigned, and they may end up incarcerated. And so I didn't like public defenders until I learned why many of them are doing what they're doing in the courts. Once again, this word has been said all day, the culture of the system. They are growing up professionally on culture where to process people is okay. And so, yes, we have people who are public defenders who are learning trial skills on the back support people. And they need to either get reformed or they need to go. I absolutely agree with that. But what we need to figure out is why is this happening? Why are public defenders doing this? And as they do not have the support or the resources or the time or the financial capabilities to really investigate like the $100,000 lawyer, you had a PD to act like a $100,000 lawyer, well paid lawyers have the times and resources and they can say yes, I'll take this case or no, I will not. Only brave public defenders who head office say, we need to stop this prison pipeline. We can't handle this. So yes, there are people that need reform, but Gideon's promise exists to stop that. The 15,000 public defenders, if I could take them all, I'm a nonprofit, um, I would to train them for advocacy and better and better and better training, better support. So yeah, I, that's what we cool. would do. Thank that's you. why I exist. So Vivian, just before we got on the panel, I said, uh, here's the two questions your staff gave me are you okay with me still asking you these two questions? And you said, Glenn, I don't care what you ask me. I'm gonna answer the question I wish you would have asked. So <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to actually do that. After hearing uh, this conversation as compelling and, and riveting and uh, inspirational as it has been, um, jump right in, answer the question that you wish I would have asked. So I really wanna just focus right now on um, 
the time in which we find ourselves doing this work, which is very different than the, the past eight years doing this work. Um, and to not be so uh, driven by the need for collaboration, which is a good thing, that we forget that there is real danger here. There is a danger for currently incarcerated people who um, may be in the hands of people who now feel they have permission to just do what they want to these people because the culture is now allowing this kind of vitriol and meanness and, and, and labeling people and, and dehumanizing people. Um, you know, we're, we're rolling back sentencing uh, laws on, on drug policy. We're talking about violent versus nonviolent. And so it's okay to, to, to lock up some people forever in horrible conditions, um, but not others. Um, we're responding to an opioid crisis in uh, rural suburbia in ways that we have never responded to any urban crisis. You should not have let me just go. Um, I knew what I was getting into. <laughs> um, these are, these are terrible, these are times for us to take up the mantle for justice in a way that transcends collaboration, in a way that is almost revolutionary in its nature because we have done collaboration before. And it has gotten us the system that we have now. We need to make demands. You know, famous quote everybody in here knows, right? Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Frederick Douglass, no longer alive, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got to take up the mantle that Whatever justice we ask for, whether we're coming from uh, the left or the right, if we believe in the values that I heard espoused by people on both the left and the right in this room today, the values of human dignity and worth, the, vi the, the values of an anti-racist culture, right? If we really believe in those values, then let's be brave and stand up and say what we mean when we say justice. Not just imply it, say it. We mean racial justice. We mean economic justice. We mean every kind of justice there is. And let's just not sugarcoat this issue because these times are just too dangerous. So uh, thank you, Vivian. The question was gonna be, tell us how you really feel. So <laughs> thanks for answering. <laughs> Thanks for answering that question. So I'm going to turn to the audience. I think there's someone with a microphone helping me out here uh, in the audience. Um, I see Dr. Devine Pryor here on the left. No? <laughs> uh, with a question. Can you just say uh, who you are in the agency you represent and then ask a question? Yes. Um, so good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Devine Pryor. I'm the executive director of the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions, the nation's first criminal justice research policy and advocacy center are created, developed, and run by formerly incarcerated professionals representing every discipline from law to medicine. That being said, I want to make a brief comment and then I want to ask a question. And my comment is that we, inclusive of myself, I think that we have been using some language that has not allowed us to accurately describe the problem. We have been saying that the system is broken the system is broken. And I'm here today to declare that the system is not broken. The system is producing the results that it was designed to produce. And the reason why I want to make a distinction between the use of the language, because if we continue to say the system is broken, then we're calling for a repair of the system. And if we repair a system that's causing the kind of destruction that it's causing, then we're making it more efficient. We're making it destroy us quicker and faster and destroying more communities. So the system is not broken, but it needs to be broken, right? We have to dismantle the system and we have to create a new system. We have to see beyond 
uh, the current conditions that exist in our community. I just wanted to put that as a backdrop. My question is, can anyone articulate a society where such a system that exists now does not exist and still achieve justice? Do you have a specific person to respond to that? No, anyone can respond. Can, I'm going to ask one person to respond to that. Yes, um, and, and I want to tie in like kind of like this response to, you know, what Dion was sharing, right? And that I think that uh, both like black men and law enforcement in this culture are probably uh, two of the most dehumanized groups um, in the history of this country. Um, I think that when people see black men, um, they project all types of things on them. When they see law enforcement, they project all types of things on them um, that are not true, and some are. You know, but I think that uh, that there is um, like just in terms of victimization um, and, uh, um, and and healing journey. I think that uh, just to, to your point around law enforcement as a community, um, you know, these cops are our brothers and sisters, our uncles, aunts, you know, the fathers, mothers, um, and in many cases, um, you know, witness this vicarious trauma, you know, the hypervigilance. And, and, and get very, very little support if you know about like kind of what happens internally within law enforcement. You can't talk about getting healing in, in, in recovery services in the police department because you get degunned and desked, you know? You can't talk about um, like certain types of things. And, and, and to me, I put the responsibility squarely on the head of the union, right? Because I'm like this, you're putting, you know, our officers in harm's way when you don't mandate that there's, you know, um, a, um, a transparent process around um, you getting psychological um, evaluations and emotional support when you're involved with an officer-involved shooting or when you harm somebody on the job, right? You know, I'm like, there's, there's some real things that need to happen um, to reform the culture so that, that we, we, we shift the way in which we see it. Because to me, um, the coming from the place of like kind of dehumanizing, um, you know, the institution, we can't, we can't solve the problem from that place, you know? Um, I, I think that, uh, that um, we have to kind of like look deeper at the root causes and stuff within the institution that are, that are producing the responses that we're getting from a lot of these cops. Because, um, you know, they're broken and fractured and they live in a system that, that doesn't even, it doesn't prioritize them, you know? It prioritizes their paying union dues so that someone has a tremendous amount of power and controls, you know, how they operate and function and also how they interact um, with the public. Thank you, Akila. There's a question Thank on this you. side. Hi, my name is Nazia Fiazi. I'm from John Jay College and uh, at Mount Sinai as well. Um, so I study an area called neuro law. Um, so Carlos, first I want to say to all of you, thank you for your stories and for being here. And Carlos, my question to you is, um, so you've been very resilient and uh, you've come out on the positive path. Um, so I wanted to say, looking back, what would you say to someone um, who is coming to a 13, 14 year old who is in the system, who wants to come to them with resources and say, you know, I want to help you out. What, what would you say are maybe like the top three things that would be important like for me to come to that person and say, I want to help you out and get you on the right path? What would that person need to really help them? So I start with education because um, it was only through education that I was able to expand my thoughts and learn what, what's, what, what's truly capable within me. Um, I started off just trying to get a AA in social behavior and I ended up getting like three associate degrees and like 10 certifications. So education would be one and then I'd ask the kid, what's your problem? Is it drugs? Is it trauma? Is it um, what happened to you where you feel the need to act out in such a violent manner or commit crime or things of that nature? And um, I think once he gets the education, well, for me, once I got the education, I was able to explain what was actually going on with me. And then I got the help. So then I got, the, um, got to sit down with psychologists and we went through my childhood and we talked about ways of um, being able to deal with anger or deal with um, 
trauma and, and you know, really talking about levels of violence and, and watching my parents fight, my mom slice my dad's throat, you know, things like that, how to be able to process that because I didn't have a conduit for it as a child. And so it was easy for me to go with these other people who did all these bad things in my neighborhood and they never asked about that stuff. They said, hey, you want to drink? Here you go. You want to smoke? Here you go. You want to use drugs? Here you go. And all that became easier than actually dealing with the core issues. So first, educate the child and then actually work on them. Um, rather it just be you counseling him or get him into a group with other children alike where they can, I mean, for prisoners, for, for me, an ex-incarcerated person, when I was inside, when we did these groups and we opened up about these groups, it was really deep. And so what Scott did when we came home is that we, we do these healing circles and they're really deep. These are grown men, all of us out, all of us have jobs. I mean, to be an ARC member, you have to have a job, you have to be in school, you have to be the top of the top. And we're talking about things that affected us as a child and we're teared up in this room and we're grown men and it's deep, it's powerful. So that, that, that's what I would have you do for him. Thank you, Carlos. We have nine minutes left. I'm gonna try to squeeze in as many questions as possible. Hi, I'm Dara Baldwin. I do disability policy. So first, thank you all for doing this. And my question is for the young lady from Gideon's Promise. But before I do that, I want to answer your question, Glenn. When you oh, said no, 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 no. People, people go to uh, <laughs> police stations. I, said, I just want you to know, yes, people with disabilities who are victims of crime, it is very hard for them to get someone to listen to them. Um, specifically developmental disability. If you're a black woman who's raped, they will tell you, you don't know what happened to you. So I just want you to know that. And it hasn't been said in this space, but our LGBTQIA community, specifically trans, uh, when they go, they are victim, you know, they are not listened to, they are not helped. So I just want people to understand and know that. Um, and it's all disabilities, deaf people, blind people, the law enforcement looks at them and says, do you even know what a crime is and what would happen to you? Because they're not trained in what pe who people with disabilities are, so don't say that. So my question is, how do we get public defenders to also accept that, to learn the ADA, which is Americans with Disabilities Act, to use it and to help our community? We have people who are deaf who get to a trial. And for those of you who know how long it takes you to get to a trial before they get an ASL interpreter. Right. So how do we incorporate their rights in this conversation? So, so before you answer, I want to point out that this side of the room is breaking all the rules. <laughs> I keep getting punked by this side of the room. I'm going to put an end to that. Mr. Mike, why don't you move to the other side? <laughs> Go ahead, Ilham. Feel free to answer that question. Um, so. So one of the things that we do at Gideon's Promise, and let me just say this, public, de public defenders have people's lives in their hands. They are the voice, they are the legal voice for the accused, right? They hold someone's life, and if they mess up, even with all the zealous advocacy they may have, that person who they've grown to care about gets sent away, sometimes for life, gets executed. So I say that because what, what we do is we, we teach our lawyers to think about the whole client. So if we had a client, for example, I call, we call it crimmigration. All this stuff that's happened to the immigrant community, which I have not heard about today on the stage, we say, you know what? They are trying to find ways to criminalize. People are getting arrested for jaywalking because they happen to be walking while brown, walking while black, and find out that they are not legal citizens and they are putting it into prison. How do our public defenders who are not equipped with immigration law deal with that? So we bring programming to our public defenders. So public defenders, many offices that we work with primarily in South, there aren't, there's no training. There's no training. You have someone's life in your hand. If you become a doctor, you have three years, I think, three to four years of residency. You learn how to become a doctor, right? You have a mentor that guides you. You get arrested, you may have someone who's a kid right out of law school who got a case three days, three days ago, has 300 cases. No one mentors and trains you. So what we do at Gideon's Promise is we provide the mentorship training. And when the need happens, when the Padilla law came down, we brought in immigration experts from New York. When um, we had issues with LGBTQ, 
uh, Mississippi, I think it was last year, had passed some legislation that was anti-LGBTQ. How do we deal with it? How are they criminalizing someone for their orientation? We brought in experts to help our public defenders learn how to advocate for people who are arrested. And so we, we represent, we try to bring in many services as we can, support services for communities who are disenfranchised. Our, our mission is marginalized communities. So if you are considered other, and that's a long list, it's growing, we find ways to help support our lawyers to advocate for you. Thank you. So we have five minutes. I think we can get two more questions in if we do this right. On this side of the room. I uh, just want to say thank you. The intimate level at which you guys, uh, I'm Sean from Hudson Link. The intimate level at which you guys got into your stories and opened up with uh, best panel of the day. Glenn, you did okay too. Um, <laughs> I gotta keep it up, I gotta keep it up. You see um, what you guys are doing to this side <laughs> of the room? <laughs> but Ms. Wilson, uh, my mom and dad are retired New York City cops, but I grew up in nine maximum security prisons from the age of 16 to 34. So I know exactly what you're sharing right now and how hard that is. I thought for the first few years I was in prison, I couldn't talk about my family, I couldn't, it's two different worlds, but it's not. And as I grew up and grew up in that system, the old, wise and black men that kind of raised me really taught me everything about how that story interacts. And I just thank you for sharing at the level that you did. I, I can't imagine the courage it takes to do that up on the stage. But I thank the rest of the panel, too, for getting into your stories as deep as you did, too, because it was, it's hard and it's, it's awkward and I appreciate it. And I, I know the rest of the crowd does, too. So it's not a question. It's more thanks but I uh, appreciate every bit of it. Thanks, Sean. I heard you invite the Attorney yeah. General to your program. I feel bad, you didn't invite me. All right, a uh, question over here on this side. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. My name is Alex Duran. I'm from the Ford Foundation. And my question is for Dion. Um, so Vivian and Ilham, you spoke about context. And when you mentioned that officer being assaulted by the incarcerated person, I thought to myself, that person was dehumanized already. Um, so when we look at context, probably there was a series of events that occurred prior to that that led that person to assault that officer. I served 12 years in prison myself, and I was assaulted by correction officers for no reasons. Um, one time in a clean correctional facility, I was assaulted just for having my hands in my pocket. So context is everything. Um, and I think when you speak to correction officers, they, they are dealing also with mass incarceration. Um, they speak about mandatory overtime, prison overcrowding, um, dealing with a population that is um, over 50% mentally ill. Um, so my question to you, Dion, is do you think that there's a space for correction officers in the decarceration movement? And could we use those voices to sort of bolster the movement? Absolutely, because I, I, I wish that, um, I wish that my husband could, could speak publicly about his experiences and what, what he has to deal with. That part, part of the issue, you know, people say to me, you know, why don't the good cops speak out? Why, why don't they say anything when these horrible things happen? And, and you're right about context. Absolutely. Um, I, I, wish I, I wish I had more time. They are not allowed to speak out. They can't. They, they, they are absolutely suppressed, shut down. They are not allowed. They can't just go on Facebook and and say and, and speak out against things that that are that they don't believe in that they don't engage in these behaviors of these rogue cops and expect to keep their job they they're not allowed to do that they're not allowed to do it in corrections they're not allowed to do it in law enforcement and so um th that that makes it seem like they don't care about that very tiny percentage of cops that twist off and act horribly, both in corrections and on the street. And it's absolutely not true. They're desperate to speak out about this. But it's, it's just, 
again, it's a systemic problem. And I, like Akila, lay a lot of the responsibility of, of this on the union. Because that's, isn't that what a union is for? To, it's a collective voice to say, hey, this isn't right. The, on one hand, the union doesn't exercise their power where they should. On the other hand, they have no power. It is extremely bizarre how that's, how that's churning out. But you're absolutely right about the abuses that go on. And there is also a component of vicarious trauma that is carried by law enforcement and corrections that is completely ignored, unaddressed. And then it is just like the vicarious trauma of people who live in highly impacted communities. Sometimes that turns outward. Instead of going inward, it turns outward. It's not different in law enforcement and in corrections than it is in communities impacted by violence. Vivian, but we're not talking have, about it. Thank you, Dion. Do you have something you want to add? Well, I concede that correction officers and police are in very difficult environments and that there are more good than bad, but I, I, I think the emphasis on their legal freedom <laughs> means that there is a slight difference in, in their power to make choices. Um, and that they're not forced to be police, they're not forced to be in corrections, and they can make other choices. Once you, once you are a ward of the state as a, as a prisoner or under the state control as a parolee, um, you don't have those choices. That's not to say that any behavior is condoned, but it is to say that your continued behavior may be a result of your circumstances, may be a result of illness, may be a result of trauma, and if that is not being addressed in the confined circumstances in which you find yourself, you don't have a choice. You can't say, I'm going to go and look in the yellow pages. I'm 58. I'm going to go and search on Google for a psychiatrist, and I'm going to go get help. You can't do that when you're incarcerated. So I just, the level, the, 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 the reality of freedom makes a difference. Okay. Cool. So in a country so mired in divisiveness, I actually feel honored and privileged to be on stage with folks who can agree and disagree and have a very robust discussion. I'm actually glad we did not prepare for this discussion. I think it made it much more robust and much more honest. And I think it's going to take a movement to get us from where we are now to the vision uh, that I've heard from folks on this stage. And movements are uh, based on relationships and truth, and they're very human-centered. And so I'm going to ask the audience to give a round of applause to these folks for sharing.